Uh, quick intro about me. So I have a pretty kind of all over the place background, you could say. <laughs> so I'm going to share a screen to show. A new share. So just as a quick kind of perspective on it. So I, um, I'm an electrical engineer, but I'm also a halfway decent mechanical engineer, uh, electrical engineer, machinist, carpenter. I can do a lot of different things. And so um, as I, I go through this, know that this comes from a place that I've worked with machinery. I've worked with um, all of these different kind of in a lot of these different environments. Um, and I was going to sharing screen is not playing nice today. There we go. So um, here are a few organizations, for example, that uh, recognized my work when I was in the classroom. Um, I spent 10 years teaching K through 12 uh, STEM, everything from programming to woodworking to physics. Um, and here are a few of the organizations. There's also two documentaries mentioned here that featured our program. You may have seen them. Um, but nowadays, I am actually uh, the uh, founder and CEO of Make Safe Tools, where we make safety equipment for power tools, um, both for the industrial and kind of makerspace market. Um, if you are running a makerspace, uh, I also do a little work in, with GritLab, which is uh, uh, does a a number of different things supporting STEM focused classrooms. Uh, I also do consulting with PBL Consulting. Um, I work with Pearson and I'm part of a nonprofit that um, helps to, to promote user centered design in classrooms. So with that in mind, you see my face for just a second. Um, I'm going to be walking through what is um, a pretty technical kind of uh, introduction to uh, high voltage switching. So this may be a little out there for some people. Um, if so, sorry, um, I did just finish a slightly simpler one, um, which I, I can send out to people. Um, and uh, I'm gonna share this and go ahead and get rolling. Here we go. Okay, so basic gist is um, when I started this company, right, we make this, power tool break was kind of pictured there. Like I learned a lot, right? Was a maker, had background technically, but in the end, uh, you gotta learn, learn and prototype and go through this process. So I learned a lot and this is gonna be my sharing of those experiences. Um, but do note that all the things I'm sharing um, are dealing with very high energy circuits. So the slightest oops can kill you, can burn your house down, can um, destroy your, brand new oscilloscope, any number of things. So just be smart and be careful. Um, if you are younger, do this with the help of an adult. Um, now, I will say though, it's, it's, you can definitely be safe doing this. Just don't go into it with the simplicity of a Arduino where you're just plugging things in. Um, a few random pictures of kind of projects I've done with kids. And uh, the story starts really with a bandsaw. So I was annoyed um, working in maker spaces that uh, when you turn a bandsaw off, it continues to spin for a long time. And it does so completely silently. And that could be terrifying when another kid or person is walking up after the fact to do another operation. Last thing you want them to do is reach for the blade to make a setup, not realize it's coasting still and get hurt. So I had started looking for ways to kind of stop motors quickly. and you might look at that and be like, oh, but it's a bandsaw. Like, how dangerous could it be? So I'm gonna show a quick video. If you are squeamish, if, no people injuries, but if you're squeamish about animals, please look away for about 15 seconds and I'll tell you when you can come back. But a bandsaw, um, one of its most common uses is for cutting meat. That's what they're good at, right? So if you go into a butcher shop, they're using a bandsaw. And so, okay, scary stuff is gone. Go ahead and uh, come back if, if, <laughs> if you left us. Um, but the, uh, let me swap that for you. And, but the, the, the way you can stop a bandsaw, there's a few ways. If you spent a little more money, your bandsaw might have a nice disc break in there. That's great. Um, if it has that, use it, it's wonderful. Um, but again, that probably needs someone to step on a foot pedal and they may or may not do that. Um, you can also get very creative with some people welding their own kind of drum brakes on. That I wouldn't recommend just because you're, you're messing with a, a tool and if you make a mistake, it, it, could, it could hurt someone. And so I um, 
started looking really deeply into how do you stop different motors. And so um, here on the screen is a, um, a couple examples of different motor types. Now, would anyone guess which of these motors is not like the other? So I'm going to look at the chat for a sec. Um, there's three motors pictured here. And if anyone could say kind of which one is the odd man out in this case. Go ahead and put that in the chat. I'll give you guys just a sec. OK, people are saying middle one. That it's DC. A couple people are saying middle. Um, someone else says left. So um, it can be really hard to tell. The, the things that are shown here, there's two types of motors. One is an induction motor. Um, that is basically what Tesla, the inventor, not the company, um, is famous for, is inventing the induction motor. Um, and the two on the outside are both induction motors. Now, this one on the left is a single phase induction motor. I can tell because it has some uh, starting and run capacitors on it. We're not gonna get into why that's important. But the one in the middle is what's called a universal motor. And so that is the odd one out here. And you can tell because it has um, this little access port here is where brushes are. So if you think about using a saw or a Dremel and you kind of see sparks out of the back of it, um, that's a universal motor. Much higher speed, there's actually um, a commutator inside which is like literally a mechanical switch making and breaking contact like thousands of times a second um, or a minute, excuse me. Um, and so uh, I started looking at these and I realized induction motors were a lot of the large machinery, right? There are some universal motors and some saws, but when we think about grinders, band saws, those were induction motors. And a fun thing about those kind of motors is that they, um, have a property where you can actually use them very easily as a brake themselves without modifying them. Um, and just a quick shout out, Tesla, the company, actually uses induction motors in their cars. And this T is actually a cross section of the stator, the, the windings of an induction motor. That's what this shape is. So the more you know. Um, so I, um, was learning about induction motors and there's there's a couple different kinds of ways you can break them um, and by break I mean you know decelerate bring to a stop uh, and so I started doing a lot of experimenting I chose DC injection which is literally you put DC into an AC motor and it makes it stop um, we could talk about that more people have questions later and so the um, there were questions um, I had to go through sourcing DC we're not really gonna get a ton into uh, but switching control and switching devices. And that's where we're going to spend the meat here. Switching control means um, what is it that you're using to control the switch? Like maybe it's a button you're pressing. Okay, fine. Maybe it's a um, Arduino or microcontroller. Maybe it's some other kind of sensor that can matter. And then at some point, there's actually a device doing the on-off switching. And you have to be careful because some kinds of switching control don't play nice with switching devices. And so we're going to walk through those. Um, the three main kind of categories that you'll run into are uh, mechanical switches, electromechanical, and solid state. So by mechanical, I mean something that a user physically interacts with. Like you are the motive force that electrically connects or disconnects something. Electromechanical means that it's still a physical contact being pushed together or pulled apart, but Instead of someone pressing it, that's being done mechanic or excuse me, magnetically in a relay, which if you were in my last session, we talked about a little bit. And then lastly is solid state. So solid state means no moving parts. This is transistors, thyristors, MOSFETs, all those kinds of things where it's actually like movement of charge on silicon, right? So three um, related but very different um, switch types that have their own kind of um, issues. And so here's an example of um, one of the first prototypes I had. So here are um, three uh, three pole double throw relays. Now, um, was actually able to implement most of my tech, what we now have as a product with just relays, except for a simple fact. Here's a slow mo video of it operating under one special case. And so hopefully you can see this. It's a, um, a relay 
trying to open at the wrong time and you see a flash. And so someone had asked in the last session about um, relays and why do they arc and why do they wear, um, why, why do they not last very long? And the answer is um, almost always that they weren't um, used for their rated purpose. And so when we think about um, a relay, it is literally two contacts being pushed together or pulled apart, right? And so if for something like a light bulb, that's a very simple electrical load, um, it is very easy to turn on and off because it's very resistive. Um, and if, uh, the only thing you would have to worry about in that case for a contact is that it has a, the appropriate current rating. Um, and if it doesn't have the appropriate current rating, it would overheat and then have problems. Um, but what the most uh, common issue is that people use slightly inductive loads or very inductive loads. And by inductive, um, I mean things like motors or a tungsten bulb or um, some power supplies, because those um, actually store some energy in a magnetic field, which is inductance. And so when you try to open them, when, when you try to open a contact, you're trying to interrupt current and that inductor does not want that current interrupted. So it's gonna generate a high voltage arc that is identical to a welding arc. And so it will literally generate a welding arc between these two contacts. Now, if they're built to handle that, they will. If they're not, they will get destroyed in very short order. So on the right here, you can see some examples. The left is what a brand new relay contact looks like. This is the same with switch contacts, by the way. Um, and on the right is what it looks like if you don't take care of it, right? You're using it outside of its um, rated kind of use case. It builds up all this residue, just like welding, right? It looks like slag if you're a MIG welder. Um, and so this destroys relays, which leads to things getting hot. Um, and if you're lucky, it won't turn on. But what happens sometimes is it'll actually weld itself on, and then you might have a motor or something that won't turn off. That's scary. So how do you control against this? Um, there's a few um, different ways. So I, I showed how that relay doesn't like inductive loads um, because of that voltage spike. That same thing also happens with semiconductors and solid state whether it's a solid state relay or a, a MOSFET. So for example, I have um, a circuit here uh, on the left, and there's a few things here. So we have a low voltage coil being turned on by a MOSFET. So a low voltage coil of a relay being turned on by a MOSFET, and then a high voltage contact connecting to an inductor. Maybe it's a motor. Now there's two things going wrong here. One, this low voltage thing is going to pass current through this inductor and through your MOSFET. Oops. And when your MOSFET tries to turn off, this relay or this coil is going to say, nah, like I'm going to create a high voltage instead. And it will create a, a voltage spike that will destroy your semiconductor instantly, first time you use it. Um, and I'm talking about like on a five volt system, that voltage spike might be 100 volts could even be in the kilovolts depending on the inductor. And this could be a tiny relay. So it's, it's a significant thing. And it only happens for you know, microseconds, but it's enough to really, really damage electronics. And if you've ever been like, why, am I, why do I keep blowing up MOSFETs? That might be why. Secondarily, there's also this mechanical switch part that's gonna try to open. And again, we have an inductor here, a motor. And so when this opens, that's gonna arc. Now, if this, is, uh, a, this contact is rated for that, it'll be fine. But if it's not, it will destroy it in short order. Um, and so you, when you look at a relay, it'll actually say on it horsepower rated for motors, or it'll have an inductive load rating. It'll say like, for a resistive load, I can safely do 100 amps. For an inductive load, I can safely do 5 amps. Um, and so just making sure you're paying attention. So some ways you can deal with this right? Because obviously we still have to do this. Um, there's, if you go online, you're going to read a ton of different options, um, most of which in my experience didn't make a big difference. Um, and so some things you'll see is you'll see people have some kind of surge protection device. It might be a TVSS, a transient volt, voltage surge suppressor, it might be a couple Zener diodes back to back. But the idea being that when this uh, coil tries to spike its voltage, it will just short circuit here and therefore not get downstream and destroy your MOSFET. 
and that, that'll work. Might not be the best option, but it'll work. Um, you can also have what's called um, a flyback diode. And so this is very common. You might've heard of a flyback transformer, right? It's very similar concept. Um, and so when, when this um, voltage source is kind of charging this inductor, right? It's passing current, let's pretend it's going left to right. Um, that'll develop a charge. So when this tries to open, the voltage of this inductor will flip. And normally that's gonna spike voltages and cause an arc. But notice that this diode was put in here. And if we, if we can assume this is DC right now, um, when this flips voltage, it will actually just basically conduct that kind of extra energy in this loop, right? And so that's called a flyback diode. That's only a trick you can use with DC circuits though. Otherwise, it would, if it was an AC circuit, right, it would, it would short out. Um, but it lets it dissipate the energy here as heat instead of sending it upstream. You will hear people talk about RC snubbers, um, which is literally R and C, a resistor and a capacitor that you can put across a coil or across a switch contact. And they make some difference, not a lot. Um, I didn't have great success with them. You also get into the, the position where um, to get a capacitor that's rated to be used at high voltages, they're very expensive and very large. Um, and most people don't even know that. They're called like X and Y rated capacitors. Um, and it might be $5 for like the cheapest one and it's humongous. Um, the other worrisome part is if you look at this RC snubber here, right? Theoretically, this would dissipate some of the energy that would otherwise damage this contact. But you now also have a current path to your load when the switch is off. Now it's a tiny one. I mean, it would be conducting milliamps, but that's enough to shock you. Um, or that could cause problems with your load, depending what your load is. So if that's allowed in your situation, great. In a safety situation like our product, we can't do that because we need to make sure off means off. Um, and so that what, what I've found that kind of worked for me is, uh, and, and this was kind of the easiest way, you know, version 1700 after doing this for a while, um, was to go um, and get a, uh, first of all, a MOSFET that's made for inductive loads. They're sometimes called inductive load drivers or just drivers or relay drivers. Um, and they're very inexpensive. I mean, you can buy a little um, MOSFET like this for four cents. Um, and it has, you can see built into it, a flyback diode and some TVSS protection and a few other protections. So it's already like equipped to handle this small little coil spike, right? So that's just a new part you buy instead of a normal MOSFET, super easy, highly recommend it. You can even get like a dip package that has 10 of these in it because they're very common in like an automotive application. That, that dip package with 10 of those might be 10 cents. So um, a very easy way to go. And then you could drive this directly from a microcontroller. Um, and so that's a very, very easy way to do it. Um, but for this, um, this uh, contact part, it's still a little tricky because still assuming it's DC, um, we, we can do flyback diodes and some things like that. But if we start getting into AC, can't do a flyback diode anymore. We talked about how the RC snubber creates an alternate current path. Like how do you how do you protect those contacts from the inductive load if if um, if it's excessive, and so one thing you can do is electrically commutate the signal, um, and so commutate just fancy word for on off, um, and so this shown here is a triac, which is a um, a very old school switch. Um, I mean the best resources for them were written in the 70s, but they're also very very common. Um, and it's basically uh, an easy switch for switching alternating current, um, which, for example, a MOSFET can't do without significant kind of backflips. So um, I'm going to show you how that kind of uh, works out, I thought. Um, I'll just talk about it then. So um, a, a thyristor, which I'm, I'm not going to go into what it is specifically, but it's a way that it automatically turns itself off every half cycle of AC. So if you think about alternating current as a kind of top half hump and then a bottom half hump, right? It's, it's alternating in a sine wave. Every time it crosses zero, this will turn itself off. And then you can choose to turn it on again or not on the following cycle. 
And so you can use something like that to turn off the load before you turn it off with a relay. Again, we're getting a little more complicated here. May not be what you're looking for, but it's possible. So um, I'm gonna skip that part real quick. So uh, talking about that um, triac again. So you can think about it like, like an AC transistor. It does have limitations. For example, um, if a load is too inductive, it will have problems too. <laughs> but you can buy ones that are made to handle inductive loads. They're sometimes called snubberless triacs or a um, alternister is like an, uh, kind of the Kleenex brand version, right? An alternister. Um, and they're also burn a lot of power. Um, and you can't really simulate them. It's, it's very difficult to simulate them in, in software. Um, so I'm going to show a quick example of like how one of those might work. And by the way, someone in my last asked about a, uh, um, a uh, solid state relay. So a solid state relay, um, most of them have this inside. This is exactly what's inside it, is a thigh wrister, normally a triac, or you can have a similar thing that's functionally the same. Um, and so if you buy a solid state relay, all it is is these couple parts um, and maybe an isolator. And you know, a solid state relay is 20 bucks and these parts by themselves are 75 cents. <laughs> um, and so just an advantage being able to do it yourself. So some cool things about this, um, uh, these uh, triacs. One is you can use it for basic on off control. So if you see this circuit here, we have a, let's say a lamp. Let's say that's our load and we have a incoming voltage. This is our switch, right? And it is controlled by this little switch over here that controls its gate or kind of on off signal. So it feels kind of like a MOSFET or a relay there, um, but this lets us use a very low current switch to turn this on. Now, what's interesting is once you turn that on, it will stay on regardless of what you do with that switch until it meets the next what's called zero crossing. So if we imagine that switch was on and we let the switch off like here, it would continue to conduct until it got to a zero crossing. There's some better animations to look at online if that's a little weird, but trust me, it's a thing. Um, there are also some tricks you can do to do real easy rectification if you want to make like a half wave rectifier for a power supply. But where it gets really magical is doing phase control. So if you think about um, an AC motor in a consumer appliance that has a couple settings, it is probably using this phase control. And what it does is it takes the normal signal that's your AC voltage, you know, coming in or out of any um, consumer device, a vacuum, for example. And what it'll do is it'll use some um, either a little analog circuit or a digital circuit to basically turn it on halfway through each cycle. So you see this little animation down here on the right. Imagine that the only parts that were let through the switch were these green parts. So it's, it's, it's chopping, they sometimes call it a phase chopper. It's chopping up that signal. Um, so that can be kind of a really interesting um, way to do this. And it lowers the power going to the motor. So you can have a few different settings. That's something we use in our product. Um, and so thigh wristers, whether it's an individual triac or it's a solid state relay, um, can do this kind of phase control, which is, um, can be really interesting. So there's a, a pretty version. Um, I did mention, however, that, uh, and I know we're running short on time, so I'll be quick on these last couple. Um, couple quick things to be uh, thinking about uh, on, and I can share this presentation, but to be thinking about when you're working with these things. One is isolation. Um, you do want to have some kind of separation between your kind of safe low voltage world, your Arduino maybe, and the things you plug into the wall. You don't want to have any wire actually going between them. And so um, an electromechanical relay is a way you could do that. Um, you can also do things like um, an opto isolator, which is a part you use that literally has a light on one side and a light receptor on the other. And it just looks like a little black box, but it literally shines light across a gap. So there's no electrical connection. Very common. Um, and, uh, but you do want to be really thinking about that kind of isolation. 
because not only can it blow up your electronics, um, but you can get strange current paths where, for example, you conduct current from your, um, if you were working on a vacuum, let's say, from your vacuum through your Arduino, through your oscilloscope and into ground, thereby frying everything in the middle, including maybe your $2,000 oscilloscope. I would only know because I've done it multiple times. Um, and so uh, things like that can be really important. And so as, as you get into it, just look up isolation or functional isolation it can be really useful. Um, and lastly, a lot of these things burn power. Here's one example. This is a triac. If you're putting 20 amps through it, it's burning 20 watts of heat. 20 watts. That is a huge amount of heat, especially if left on over time in a enclosure. And so just making sure that you're doing thermal um, control. There are Google kind of thermal calculations. There's some really fun things you can learn. It's not super um, hard to get into. Um, and so just kind of summarizing then. So in that electromechanical world, right, we do have a physical air gap, which is really nice. You know, you have two wires that have literally been pulled apart that are not touching anymore, which can be nice for just like comfort and, um, you know, peace of mind and safety and all those things. They have negligible heat, right? They're two pieces of the metal touching each other. They don't, I mean, unless you're really overworking it, they, you don't have to worry about heat. Um, they tend to be a little bit big. They're also not very good at breaking inductive loads unless you buy one that's specifically for that, in which case its cost and size will grow. Um, and they, um, they wear over time, right? Even if you treat it nice, like it's not gonna last forever. Maybe it'll last 10 years, 20 years, but depending on your application, um, it would matter. Like if you're controlling your water heater, you wanna be pretty sure your water heater's working right when you're on vacation. So you, you, know, you wanna invest in something robust. Um, on the other side, solid state, like a um, thyristor or a, um, or a solid state relay. They're very inexpensive, simple control. They last forever, right? They're fast, so they can switch on and off really quickly. Um, and they're, they're really good at um, breaking contact as long as you're careful about those inductive loads. Um, and so being very cautious if you're doing anything inductive to make sure that um, you're protecting against that. Um, and if you wanted to get, uh, there are some other things you can read these when, when I send this out. Um, and then the uh, last couple of things I'll say is when you're thinking about the safety, and I know I mentioned this in the beginning, if you're gonna go into these kind of projects, like highly recommend it, I think you can do a lot, but really um, get in the habit of doing that, um, like take five seconds to think about it before you plug it in each time, making sure you're never working on it plugged in, make sure you have fusing um, and uh, circuit protection that um, you know will help if something goes bad. Um, and then of course, do a little bit of research. Um, and uh, again, if you, if you look up isolation, there, there's a huge amount of resources online. Um, and then I'll just show real quick, kind of this is a very early iteration of our technology that, um, and kind of how it turned out. Um, uh, we now have industrial uh, uh, UL listed versions and all that stuff. But just to show you kind of what you can do with this, um, this is a relatively small box, right? And here is a um, disc sander that when you would turn it off would normally take over a minute to coast down, right? So that's just a hazard sitting there all the time. So on the left, you have one that's plugged into our device. And when you turn that off, it stops in less than a second. And that's all done with just the switching stuff I was showing you guys. Um, and so you can do a lot with this, whether it's for tool safety or anything else. So hopefully that was um, useful. Um, I can stick around for a, um, a minute or two if you guys have questions. If you do, please put them into the, um, into the kind of Q&A area um, and I'll hang out for a sec and go from there. And then lastly, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna put my contact information into the, the chat um, and also um, our website. So if you want, um, if you have questions or you want to, uh, or, or you want a copy of this, let me know and I can make that available. Um, and then, um, and I see questions about links to slides. Um, 
Yes, I don't have anywhere to post them though. So email me if you want slides and I can get them to you. I just put my email address into the um, chat. I don't, think they, I don't think they let us post retroactively on the um, Maker Faire thing, but I can check. Um, and then I, I see a question from Natoy. Um, do you share or post any lessons that you host lead outside of the Maker Faire? Oh, um, thanks that you like them. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't, um, I do webinars on, in the industrial space typically. Um, and so all about industrial safety and engineering controls and things like that. Um, but if you uh, email me kind of specifically what you're looking for, I can point to a lot of resources, some of which I've made previously, but also just places to get stuff. Um, oh, and I did not share that with everyone. So I'm, I'm retyping my email address, sorry about that. I apparently just sent it to panelists. So you should have it there now. And then also if you're running makerspaces, do check out our products. Um, they were kind of invented from a guy that uh, spent time making makerspaces safer. And so you can do access control, you can do braking. I um, mean, it just makes it a little safer for everyone that's there. Um, and we do some pretty good discounts for schools. Um, I see uh, someone's asking about the gritlab.com. Um, it should be gritlab.org. That might be the issue. So go ahead and go to um, gritlab.org. Um, and that is the kind of ed my old education site from when I used to do that kind of stuff. Um, and that'll go up. Um, and that, that's an answer to Don. 